Anthony Walker, 18 year old male, suffered a serious head injury approximately 11 months. The girls he would have loved. As my husband. As my wife. To the end of our days. I pronounce them husband and wife. The dancers he would have danced. The people he would have helped. The children he would have had. You will not have the life he could have lived. My son, Anthony. On BBC One and iPlayer. Hello and welcome to BFI at Home. My name is Akria Jamfi and tonight I'm joined by Tahib Jimmo, Reiki Aola, Julia Brown and BAFTA award-winning writer Jimmy McGovern. And they join me to talk about the BBC drama Anthony. Anthony is based on the life of 18-year-old Anthony Walker, who was murdered by two white men in an unprovoked racist attack in a Liverpool park back in 2005. And just to let you know, Anthony is available on BBC iPlayer. And to watch this, please see the link in the description below. So this film comes on the 15th year anniversary of Anthony's death. And I think the first obvious question to ask um, is why you all thought it was important to be a part of this story. Reiki, I'll start with you. I was sent the script by my agent and uh, I, I remembered Anthony's story. So I was confused when I started reading and saw that we were seeing him as an adult, uh, um, as, a, as a man in his twenties, knowing that he died at 18. Um, and then I, I read stage directions, understood the format that, that Jimmy put in place. Um, and when I read it, I thought I would love to be involved in this. But I also thought straight away, was his mother involved in this? Because if she wasn't, I don't want anything to do with it. And my agent said that she was. And then when I met Terry McDonough, our, our director, I asked him again, please tell me that G Walker knows this is happening. And he said, this was her idea. Um, why is it important? Well, I'd start by saying that, that no television is important if it's gonna trigger you to the point that you, you can't come back from the trauma. But the reason it's important to tell this story is because um, Jimmy and G wanted to keep Anthony's name in the world, keep us talking about him, keep, keep us thinking about him and about other young men like him whose lives have been lost senselessly. It's a story of loss and how much an, is lost and how many people lose out when such senseless things happen. And it's a story about the love of a really beautiful human being um, who would have been doing great things in the world because that's what he'd set his mind to do. Thank you. Uh, Julia? Um, that was similar to Reiki, but for, for me, when I was growing up, uh, Anthony's story was one of the first that I'd heard. And I was so shocked and appalled that somebody could be killed just for the color of their skin but then sadly it wasn't the last that I heard and um having to hear these stories all the time and still today it's still happening I think it's so important to uh make something that reminds people of all the moments of Anthony's life and many others that can so easily be robbed um so yeah and the script was such an interesting and innovative way of showing that and it al almost makes the grief and sadness hit you so much harder at the end um but it's beautiful and hopeful as well because uh well the first half just shows you all these beautiful moments that him and his family could have had so yeah as soon as i read the script i couldn't put it down and i was so fortunate to then get cast in it and really excited to be a part of it so he um i think uh i listened to an interview that g had done and she was talking about <clears throat> she was talking about all the things that she would never get to see uh, Anthony do. She'd never get to see him get married. She'd never get to see him have a have a child. She'd never get to see him do, get his dream job and and do it. And so when the script came through and we got to see all of those moments, um, I think what I wanted was to maybe give those tiny moments that she had lost, like maybe in a small way, give those those moments, those huge moments, back to her. And so, um, and so, yeah, I think that was the main driving force for me, but also to, to, ha to be able to tell a story like this. And for 15 years after he's passed, for Anthony Walker to be uh, another way in to have the conversation about racism and to address it and to re-examine our relationship with it, um, it, was, it was brilliant. And so, yeah, for those two reasons, I wanted to tell the story. And Jimmy, obviously, uh, I mean, we've heard that G asked you, but just before we get into that, why was it important for you to tell this story? I can't add much to what's been said, really. Mm. It's just that everybody talks about loss, but I don't think 
I don't think it's been as powerfully portrayed before as it is in this film, because we see what's been lost before we get there. Thank you. Um, Reiki and Tahib, I want to ask what has your personal experience of racism been in the UK, if you have experience, because I think it's, it's, a, it's kind of expected that people of colour experience racism, but not everyone experiences it in the same way. So maybe just to get a feeling of your experiences, especially after the recent resurgence of it becoming headline news with Black Lives Matter and um, George Floyd, etc. What have been your experiences? I'll start with Tahi. Um, I think, you know, I think my experiences with racism have been a lot more institutional. And so uh, I'm always aware that like systems are set up without people like me in mind. And so, you know, like going, it's just a case of always feeling excluded wherever you go, really. Um, like going to drama school, like it's, it's just a system. Like, I think I've navigated my way through life knowing that I'm in a country that wasn't really made for me and doesn't really accommodate me. And so um, it's just been a constant thing. There have been like microaggressions with like, um, individuals and stuff like that. People have said insensitive things. Like I, I get stopped and searched by the police a lot. I have been like so many of my friends have really like horrific encounters with with like the police, for instance, but also with institutional racism. And so I think it's just always been there. Like if I was to sit here and list every single time someone has said something that was insensitive or insulting or derogatory, then you know we'd be here all day. But um, but yeah, I think for me it's just I've always been aware of the fact that it's there and it's in society and it's built into institutions. Thank you. Reiki? Well, um, like Tahib says, institutional racism is is just bubbling away all the time. But um, And I'll ask this question because it's you asking. That the last time someone asked me, I thought, well, you know what, you really don't have the time to listen. But um, uh, overt, uh, if you'd asked me this question last year, I'd have said nothing overt for some time. But uh, in January, end of January, beginning of February, I was on my way to see um, a matinee, you know, of a, of a play. And I was waiting to get on a tube at North Greenwich train station. And a young woman who from her accent, I knew immediately was Italian, came and stood too close to me. And I was aware of that because there was no one else standing there uh, at the door I was at. And there were, there were other places she could have stood, but she made a point of coming to stand so close to me. This was before COVID, but it, she was just ridiculously close but also so close to the barrier that I said, I said, oh, you might need to stand back because if someone wants to get off, they won't go. To. And uh, she said, yeah, I know I've been here five years. Okay. And when the train pulled in, she put her hand up on the barrier so that I couldn't get past it to form a, a barrier between me and the entrance to the tube and beckoned to some people she was with to get on with her. She then had to stand back. At this point, I'm really confused by what's going on. Uh, she then had to stand back to let someone off. And as she did, I got on. She was determined to get on before me. So we got on shoulder to shoulder. Now, bearing in mind, there was, I'd been waiting for two whole minutes with no one standing around me at all. There was no need for this to happen. We got on shoulder to shoulder. I then say, what the hell was that? And she turns to me and says, did you not see the color of my skin, you black C-U-N-T? I'm a European. And I think, wow, that escalated quickly. This young woman, around Tahib and Julia's age, Italian, clearly decided that she was gonna feed her racist inclinations at, on me. She was, she was gonna feed on me. She came from nowhere. There were, there were half a dozen doors to my right that she could have stood at where no one was standing. She needed, in that moment, to get some agency to get some supremacy at my uh, expense. All I could think was I need to say something. She was with people I, I learned were her brother and her mother, and they were sort of shouting at her in Italian to keep quiet. Her brother was ushering her down the train to get away from me because I was thunderous. I said, I'm not gonna shout, I'm not gonna scream, I'm just gonna walk towards you very slowly. I had no idea what I was going to do when I reached her. I just knew that whatever it was, I needed to do it really close. And I walked along with people had their headphones on. I'm willing to believe they hadn't heard it. But then one young black man stood up as I passed him and he looked at her and said, what was that you just said? So I knew I hadn't imagined it. Then I touched his arm because I thought I don't need him going to jail for me. 
but I was glad he was there. And then I just get very close to her and her brother's going, she's sorry, she didn't mean it. She's really sorry, she's really sorry. And I say, I don't know what you hope to achieve just then. I just need you to know that what you've done is you've given some people here a reason to say, this is why they don't want you or me here right now. That's all you've achieved. And then I stood really close to her for the rest of the journey with her brother standing between us in case anything kicked off. I thought, wow, you black C-U-N-T. I'm just going about my middle-class business on my way to the theater. I was not ready for that. I mean, uh, there's so much I could say but it's not about me. <laughs> 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 uh, um, so in, on the back of that, this is something a lived experience that people of color experience a lot. And it's very hard to articulate this, especially if you grow up in a country that you do love. We're born into this country, we do love it, but it's hard to love completely because of these microaggressions and overt aggressions and this feeling that this system isn't built for us. So Julia, I think, I mean, it's, you have to have pride in your country. It's, it's, we all have pride of where we're born, where we come from and our history and heritage. But how have you, um, I mean, you play Anthony's wife in uh, the reimagining, Catherine in the reimagining of his life. How have you viewed the UK prior to being involved in this project? And have you felt that it's, have you felt comfortable hearing that people feel that this country is racist? And what have maybe your, been, what, have your, what has been your experiences from your viewpoint of understanding the UK and its um, complex uh, perspective from other people? Yeah, I, I was really fortunate that my parents kind of brought me up um, and made me very aware of uh, my privilege and what I have um, and how I don't need to fear going out and standing at a bus stop and potentially danger coming my way. Um, but this d being a part of this has made me so much more aware of my privilege and it's educated me in ways that I didn't think was possible. And it, it's been so good because it's helped me feel less worried about speaking and sometimes saying the wrong thing. And I think sometimes I was worried about having discussions with my black friends or um with people who have experienced racism because I was worried about saying the wrong thing or causing offense or anything and now this has taught me that it's better to say something and then maybe make a mistake and say something again rather than um saying nothing at all but uh I think what's going on right now with as you say George Floyd and the Black Lives Matter movement is a great thing that it's happening now but it definitely should have happened a long time ago and I'm so happy to uh, that it is happening and be involved in these discussions and be involved in a piece that hopefully will make a lot of people uh, listen and look at it in a different way um, but yeah no I I've definitely always been aware of the problems in the UK mm -hmm. um, but I feel like I'm just becoming more and more aware of my privilege and how important it is for me to use my privilege to speak up for others. Thank you. Um, Jimmy, uh, you know, you're writing about something which happened in Liverpool where you're from. Were you in Liverpool around the time of Anthony's murder? And if so, what was the mood like prior to and afterward? And did you grow up knowing or feeling the racial tensions? And again, it's that same thing of having pride in a country that has a bit of a problematic history and current present. Yeah, uh, the impact of the uh, Anthony Walker killing was huge. It was immense, you know. And I keep on saying um, the city produced the two killers, but it also produced the people who gathered around the Walker family. You know, um, um, I hate my city for producing the two killers, but I'm so proud of my city for the way in which it rallied round. You know, um, and I grew up post-war, so you can imagine I saw racism. You know, mm. I never suffered it, never suffered it, but I saw it. You know? And so this drama, speaking of the drama, it chooses to work backwards from Anthony's life at age 25 and until the fateful night. Uh, Jimmy, can you also expand on why you decided to tell the story in this way? Uh, we, had, we had to find a new way in because when G asked me to do it, the BBC had just shown the uh, Daniel Ola Taylor drama. So we couldn't tell our drama, our story in, in anything like the same way. Um, so we had to find a fresh way 
And um, I, I, th I think um, I'd been thinking about reverse chronology for a while anyway. And uh, that it just seemed to be the obvious way in, you know, to show what he could have achieved and then see it all snatched away. You know, it just, it just seemed, it, I don't know, it just seemed to be a marvellous opportunity to, to, to get that story told. I fear the BBC might have said no if we tried to do it in a more conventional way, having done the Daniel Lord Taylor story. And just to, I, I didn't, I wanted to ask, how did you meet G Walker? How did, how did you guys cross paths? Oh, I'm ashamed to say I used G uh, every time I wanted, every time I wanted to find out about grief and loss, forgiveness, atonement, all the stuff I write about. Uh, I went along to G first uh, and I'd been doing that since 2007, maybe even 2006. Uh, and then one day G came to me and said, it's my turn now, Ginny, you know, and uh, I, it's, so she, that's when she asked me to tell the story of her son, Anthony. Uh, and I remember, the, I remember the exact words I said to G, if you're asking me to do this, G, I have a God-given duty to do it, so I will do it. And what was it about G that, you know, made it, I guess, in, in working with her, because I say you're saying that you used her, but obviously she was willing and, and, and thought-giving you know, she was happy to contribute. So what was it, how is it that, because I think there's a lot of creatives that we work with that do need to find authenticity and consult with the right people when telling certain stories. So what was it about G and how she expressed herself that you were able to use to bring into the work that you've done with this project and prior? Um, I, I think part of it is the story was so horrific. It was a particularly horrific killing, you know, uh, but her response to it, was was incredible, you know. And she almost immediately said, I forgive the killers, you know. Um, and she sp every time she spoke to me, she brought a wisdom to it. Um, I, can, I, I, I can't think of any examples, but she was always tremendously wise about the issue of loss and grief. Uh, fantastically wise on the issue of revenge, you know. Um, I think the, one of the big things she said, this is the kind of thing she would say, uh, I'm not interested in hate, Jimmy, you know, because it was hate that killed my son. You know, stuff like that was, it's, it just opens your eyes, doesn't it, all the time, you know. So she was wonderful, is wonderful. Yeah. Um, so he, how did you prepare to get into this role? And wh who, wh who did you speak to and what did you choose to connect with Anthony, to bring him to you, for you to use to bring him to life? Because obviously you've got to kind of embody this guy, even though you don't know him, just know of this horrible story and to reimagine him as someone who's warm, loving and caring. Um, you need to get those bits. And what yeah. did you do and how did you do that? Um, I think it's interesting because so much of this story for me, so much of my job in it is to portray a life that Anthony didn't live. And so mm -hmm. um, I wasn't, you know recreating moments that actually happened and so for th those aspects of the of the film i could just you know like actors do regularly i could just like dig into the script and jimmy had written us a brilliant script and there was so much to dig into and, and eke out from there i think jimmy obviously knows so much about anthony like from the conversations that he's had with g spanning years and you could tell like that much history had gone into the script and into the text. And so all of that was there for me to, to sort of dig out and to, and to flesh out and to find. But, um, but I, am a, I am playing a real person. So um, we spoke to, I spoke to G, I spoke to uh, a couple of Anthony's friends who had played basketball with him and somebody who had played basketball with, um, who, whose brother had played basketball with him. And again, like there were so many through lines through the conversations that we had, like the same key characteristics kept coming up, his charisma, his charm, his humor, his, uh, his warmth, his heart, all of that just kind of fleshed out a, a, a character and a person that I very quickly started to understand. And in terms of my way into this character, um, I was always aware that, you know, this is a story that's very close to my heart and it's a topic that's very close to my heart. And I'm aware that had I been born at a different time and was I in Liverpool at that bus stop on that night, that could have been me, that could have been anyone. And so um, that immediately rooted me into this. And um, there was a part of me that kind of felt like, you know, I'm not from, I'm not from Liverpool, so why am I telling the story? I'm from London. But I think there's, you know, this is a story of a black man and, um, you know, I defy anyone to tell me that I can't tell that story. And so um, I think 
yeah, it was a lot of things. And mainly it was rooting myself in the script that Jimmy had given me, the conversations I had with G and some of Anthony's friends and people who knew him, who knew him and also just my own relationship with this topic. I think all of that meshed together and, and gave me the character that um, you can catch on BBC iPlayer. <laughs> Thank you. And actually, just expand on the fact that you are a black man who's telling a story of a black man who was murdered. How does that work emotionally and spiritually? And how did you maybe shake off Anthony, which is, it sounds a bit... Not, not exactly nice to say, but then how did you reconcile that? Because this is, this is an ongoing problem. And, like, and referring back to George Floyd, Stephen Lawrence, Breonna Taylor, all these things are happening it's, repetitively, yeah. so, repeatedly, sorry. And so how do you, this must have been like spiritually hard, right? Yeah, so difficult. It's so, so, so difficult. I still do interviews. Like I spent this last week doing interviews and there are times where I just come off the, like the phone or the Zoom and I'm just in tears. It's so emotional. It is so, so, so emotional. Um, Reiki, you made a really good point actually in one of the other interviews that we did that there isn't actually anybody on set who like looks after that part of the work. Like there isn't anybody who checks in in the same way that there's an intimacy coach who checks in and makes sure that you're comfortable with the intimate scenes that you might have to do. Nobody really checks in to make sure that you're okay with like the emotional scenes that you have to do because like we have to go to some really, um, really tough places. And um, I think just in terms of life, how I deal with all the stuff that's going on, I don't really know. I'm kind of winging it. I think we all are. Everybody's just taking it one day at a time. Um, yeah, I don't really think I have an answer for you. I think that's part of why this story is so important it's because it's something you can't really turn off. I can't turn off conversations about race. Um, and, and I think it's also important to know for people who are watching that, you know, you can turn that program off and it ends after 90 minutes for you maybe, but this is, this has been 15 years for G Walker. This has been a lifetime. This has been centuries. And, and, and so, yeah, it's something that you can't turn off. So it's an ongoing thing and I'm still processing how to deal with it. Of course. Um, Reiki, you play G Walker, who is a formidable woman. And as mothers who suffer the death of a child often tend to be. But what was the most kind of resonant conversation that you must have had with G that enabled you to play her so brilliantly and so um, authentically? She said to me at the read through, um, uh, for a start, she, she sort of blessed me. She, she prayed for me through when we were talking. She, she held my hand and, and quietly prayed for me. But she said, uh, I think Jimmy's done a, a great job with this script and I, I hope that people will watch it and that it might give someone a few more seconds to get away. And I didn't ask you to explain that, but I went away and I thought about this mother who for 15 years has possibly been thinking a few more seconds of doubt from the perpetrators might have been a few more seconds for her son to get up off the floor and run. Uh, and I just thought that was massive because she wasn't saying, I hope we change the world with this 90 minutes. She was saying, if, if it flashes through someone's mind, even if the title of it flashes through someone's mind, that might be enough time for someone to get away. So the, the realization that, that she couldn't change everybody's behavior, but something, just enough of a change to allow other people not to go through the loss that she's gone through. That's what I took from what she said. And I thought that's huge. And that plus her being the woman who, who'd been able to forgive because she wasn't going to put her energy into hating meant that I felt a massive responsibility get even bigger in that moment. Um, and you know, and now all this is happening while she's holding my hand. Um, it's a, I, I, I don't think I could have gone through anything more spiritual if I'd been in front of the Dalai Lama, to be honest. I, that's how she felt. I, just felt I, was, I was breathing in something so huge from her. I don't know that she knew she was giving me something so huge, but that's how I felt. I don't, I don't think I could have. I wanted to kind of ball up everything that I'd experienced with her and just keep it with me so I could open it and breathe it and smell it and taste it. That's the effect she had on me. Uh, so I felt a real duty uh, and, and I'm, I'm so 
pleased and grateful that that we we've spoken since and we had a dance together at the rap party and that when she was on set she um she told me that uh, we were shooting the wedding reception she told me that seeing Tahib and I dancing is how she thinks it would have been for her and Anthony but all those moments are like little things that I've got in a little box of treasures with her name on she's a very extraordinary human being um that uh kind of moves me actually because just imagining the mother somebody watching a scene that she's never going to have but seeing it visualized um and i'm just reflecting back i'm emotionally a little bit choked up on thinking about that but how do um this is a this is a traumatic story so and i think there's an element of we, we have this conversation about being asked to relive our pain in this creative way quite often so how did you reconcile that reiki because obviously you knew this as has been mentioned Anthony Walker's story deserves to be told, but how in this, especially in this current climate where these are the stories that get supported more than maybe other, you know, less stressful stories from us get commissioned and told. How did you reconcile being a part of this, knowing that actually we've got other problems in um, the creative community? That uh, again, it was, it was very, very important for me that she was involved and that she was involved to the extent that she was. I, I loved Jimmy's script and his way of telling Anthony's story, but, and, and I have always wanted to work with him, but even that, I promise you, would have had me putting the script down and saying, I think this is gonna be amazing and I will be happy to watch it, but I'm not gonna do it because his mother has nothing to do with it. I absolutely promise you that there's there's no uh, the, I don't I don't need my I don't need in my in my psyche and, and I don't feel my career needs me to go to a place where I couldn't look myself in the mirror and say I'm really glad we did that uh, and I know I don't ever want to worry that I'm going to bump into G Walker and have to apologize for what we've done so I would have said no if she hadn't been involved in the way that she was um, so knowing that she wanted Anthony's story to be told uh, solved that issue for me completely. Yes, it's another moment where where we go through the trauma of our of our, uh, our world, our situation, and and who knows me, you know. It's and, and of course we have to tell all the stories, and it would be great if at some point somebody is as interested in the joy that we experience. As, as black and brown people in this country, it would be great if somebody's interested in in um, the things that make us happy. But for now, this is where we're at. And when it comes to how I deal with it, I don't think I deal with it particularly well. And I sort of say flippantly that after every day's filming, um, I go home and I eat. Uh, and it's the same on stage when I'm telling traumatic stories and and mining my own trauma for other people's uh, entertainment and education. I eat and I eat the worst food possible. And I keep talking about that because the more I say it, the more I hope I won't do it again. And another way to do it. I haven't actually found another way to do it. And um, and when I say, it, I mean, you know, like six packs of crisps before bed and, and then getting up at 6 a.m. to go to work again, that kind of thing. Um, so the kind of eating that you're really not meant to do is the only way I get through telling stories like this. Uh, and yeah, it would be great if there was someone on a set who who go, OK, OK, before you leave set, let me just mm. talk you through what you need. That means you can just go home and have a salad. But that's not happened yet. <laughs> um, Yes, <laughs> I think mm -hmm. we can all hold you accountable. Now you've told us all, we will definitely be texting you, <laughs> just checking in <laughs> to see where you're at. Um, um, Jimmy, I'll come to you in a second. I just wanted to ask Julia, as you know, playing, even though Catherine is a fictional addiction, you there's still an element of having to work with Tahib to bring this chemistry and reality and believability about this relationship. Um, and also, I think if we're watching it, your character enables us to see Anthony's potential side of the loving husband and father. So how did you, again, work with Tahib to do that? And what did you do to 
how did you imagine Catherine to be and how did you imagine this scenario and this relationship to bring it to life? Yeah, um, I was kind of terrified when I got the role and very terrified of, of being like the right person sat at the read through. I wasn't sure if um, I, you know, you go through in your head like I was about to sit in front of Anthony's real mum and think, oh God, I'm probably not the girl that he imagined for her son. And But I knew Catherine's character is so important in being there as a crutch to show how loving and wonderful Anthony was and what he probably would have ended up being like. Um, and getting to work with Tahib was just a dream because he sort of definitely calmed all my nerves first time I met him. I think he sh he sh I was in my costume fitting and he shouted over the curtain. He was like, hello, wifey. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay, he's, he's a nice boy. So um, that was good. And he's still got an infectious um, character to him and charisma. And we had a few rehearsals with Terry, our director, who was just brilliant at making sure we had the time to do them because sometimes you just get chucked into filming and for this project it was so important that we had that time um, and we ran through all of the nice scenes together and had time to play with the different um, parts of all our character but yeah I think it was Tahib he's he was the the key to the chemistry on screen and it was so easy to do all of those scenes with someone like him. So you were saying that you you know we were unsure if you would it's interesting that you're playing a character, but even still you have the same reservations as if in real life you were meeting the mother of a boyfriend, like, oh my gosh, are they, are they, are they gonna like me and all that type of stuff. It's so yeah. interesting how these things become so embedded into reality, though you're playing a role. Did you speak to G and did you, have, did you share those fears with her and how did she reassure you or did you seek reassurance? Yeah, I did because I, I also was worried because I was white and I was thinking, yeah. um, you know, would she does she want a black actress like am I taking this opportunity away from somebody else and um they were all there like all those fears were with me and we kind of went through the whole script and I brought them through I remember I think Reiki said the same thing but she was so nervous saying all those lines and I felt the same way but obviously I didn't have to go through the scenes that Reiki did at the end um but yeah, so getting to the end and finally getting to go over to G and speak to her and she did the exactly same thing with me. I could tell she was um, saying a little prayer and then she had some good laughs. But she, yeah, I, I said to her, oh, I was really, really nervous and I wasn't, I, I don't know if you're who I would imagine. And she said um, that what I had performed and my warmth and friendliness, um, she was like, I would, and she I actually texted her the other day in the lead up to all this coming out and had said again like I know I might not be and she said I would have loved you as a daughter-in-law and that really really warmed my heart and uh, reassured me a lot but yeah so just G was so welcoming and so friendly to all of us and every week she would send us a blessing as we went into the next mm -hmm. week of filming and uh, she's a really really special person and I'm so glad that she sort of took me into her, her heart and the, and the project. Thank you. Um, Jimmy, so, you know, there has been some discussion about why you were the right person to tell this story. And I've read that, you, obviously, you said that no one says no to G Walker. And I can imagine hearing about her, uh, her but I would probably find it hard to say no to her myself. Um, but how did you reconcile telling this story? And what length did you go to ensure its authenticity outside of speaking to G? Um, the, the, the only time I needed to be uh, authentic I had I had to be a hundred percent authentic is in the final third of the film because because that's all spot on that that, that all uh, actually happened and the, the, there's one particular scene but there, there are a handful of scenes but one particular scene that goes on forever or seems to go on forever which I think is the best in the film uh, and it's G Walker talking to a nurse at the hospital and every single word of that scene comes from G you know so I, um, I spoke to uh, all the Walker family. Um, I spoke to everybody involved in the case, you know. Uh, I spoke to a surgeon who was on duty at uh, Aintree Neuro, uh, a wonderful man, did everything he could for Anthony. Uh, so I did, um, I did everything I normally do to ensure authenticity, where authenticity was essential. Yes, I did. And did you feel any pressure because it's a, it's a story about racism and we, which is juxtaposed with the current climate and especially in the UK where it's 
initially tried to distance itself from its racist history, from its racist history by pointing to America and George Floyd saying that's happening over there. But obviously we have our own issues here and if we bring it back to the creative industry, it is about having people of colour being able to tell their stories without being told or overseen by a white person saying that, you know, they're a senior white person because they're not trusted with their narrative. What, did you feel any pressure being a white man telling this story um, and though you thought sought all the authentic, author, all the authentic um, stories to enable this to come to life, did you feel any pressure? And how do you, percent, maybe going forward in future projects, how do you ex hope to reconcile that in future productions that you work on? Uh, I felt enormous pressure. In fact, at the time I was asked by G, I saw, I, 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 I foresaw the kind of questions I'm being asked now. Sure. Uh, what I did not do, and it's unforgivable, is I did not have any say in the ethnic mix of the people of the, of the crew. I think that was, uh, that, that was an error. And I think we were congratulating ourselves on telling a black story with a black cast. And, you know, that we, we honestly didn't give it enough thought. We didn't think it through. And uh, uh, I, I promise I'll do better next time. You know? I, I mean, I appreciate you saying it because that is the... The, yeah. the, what that is the following question is like what about the crew makeup because it is about yes. making sure that if I, I don't think it's a problem that white people tell black stories but it is about making sure the environment consult consulting for authenticity of course but also the working environment reflects a more multicultural um society that we live in today which is i, I, I appreciate your honesty and we will hold you to that too <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I, 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 I think I, I think a lot of it's going to be there in the BBC anyway in future, isn't it? But it could be in writers' contracts, for instance, that you know that you you know put something in the contract so that you don't sign a contract unless it's in there. Yeah, uh, the ethnic mix of people behind the camera. Yeah, yeah it's definitely um, a way forward. So, mm. just I wanted to ask. I mean, this is, again, you've always mentioned how important, how emotional this project was. What did you learn about yourself or about, yeah, I think about yourself, because it then it expands into like how you feel about society today. But what did you learn about yourself working on this project in relation to the subject matter? I'll start with Tahir. Oh, um, again, like I haven't really tried to articulate any of this stuff. It's just stuff that's been bubbling away in my head. But um, I think um, there's something I think I kind of clumsily worded my way around when I was asked a similar question in another interview. But um, there's something about uh, me leaving Liverpool and coming away from the story and feeling like like my very existence in this country is a political act. Like there's the, I'm in a society that isn't really built. Like my being here is political. Like there, there's so much history that I just inherit by the very virtue of like of being here. And so. I kind of feel like my, the way I go forward, the way I speak my, my, my mind, the way I uh, chase my dreams, the way I go about making sure that I thrive in a, situ in a, in a system that doesn't really want me to is, um, yeah, it's essential and it's political. And I think everybody has a response. I, I think everybody should know that just by virtue of you doing the things that you want to do and, and going after it with a burning passion, that for you know people of color for black and brown people like sometimes that's enough and i think that's part of to answer your your earlier question that's part of how i let go and that's part of how sometimes i don't get overwhelmed i just go you know what me doing the things that i enjoy the things that i like and doing them well and 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 you know making my mom proud and all of that like that is enough and that's part of and that's part of all of this and so i think that's one of the biggest lessons that i've learned and i'm still learning and you know, there are ways that you can do that. And so, yeah, I think that right now is, is, is the main thing that comes to mind. Thank you. And Julia? Um, it, the job taught me a lot, um, but mostly it just made me so much more aware of uh, everything that I don't need to fear and um, that I can always say more and I can always do more um, without the fear, because I know the black community um, are always the ones who will support me and not see me as like saying the wrong thing. They can correct me if I say something wrong. Um, and yeah, I, it's just that I can always use my platform and use my privilege um, and just keep being involved with these conversations and with all minority groups as well. Um, 
because it's it discussion is the things that is the way that um important things get heard and um yeah and it just taught me to be more grateful for every day and the beauty of life and happy moments and that I can look forward to all these things without fear of them being taken away from me uh, and how special that is. Thank you. Um, Jimmy? I've, heard, uh, I've actually learned it from Julia in, in a way and uh, we, we're frightened to open our mouths often because we always say the wrong thing. I'm a 70 year old white male. I'm bound to say the wrong thing but to, to say it anyway and, and then be corrected and learn. That, I, I think that's, that's a wonderful attitude, Julia. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. And Reiki. And uh, professionally, I've learned that numbers themselves do not make the difference. And I think that's something we all need to bear in mind going forward that, that um, so simply having an enormous black cast, thinking particularly of, of our line of work, is not the thing in itself that makes the difference as we talked about what's going on behind the camera what's um are we we've we've got a whole bunch of of black actors in but have we all understood what that means what it means for them to be here for us to be working with them so it's great to hear that that jimmy's absorbed that mm. and and hopefully more people will so professionally numbers in themselves do not make the difference there's more needs to happen. Personally, um, G Walker's putting herself through I don't know what to educate, to make change in, in ways that I can't imagine. So, you know what, I can put myself through some stuff to educate and make change because, because I, I know I'm not having to go through what she's going through because I haven't been where she's been. So it's okay if if I ever feel this is too exhausting, this is going to cost me too much professionally. I mean, I'm losing friends all over the place right now, but you know what? I feel like, guys, if you cannot walk forwards with me, then I love you and you go live your life, you do what you need to do, but I cannot sit here quietly and and nod uh, when I see that stuff happening, I now need to say something. So yeah, it's, it's going to cost, it's going to be exhausting, but I'm going to do it anyway now. And finally, I just wanted to ask, what was your most memorable or I say favorite, but maybe impactful, memorable, meaningful scene from this production, trying to steer away from spoilers. Um, Jimmy, I'll ask you first. <laughs> I think, well, I think, <laughs> I think we're in danger of all picking the same scene. <laughs> but you know, I, I'm, I'm not going to pick the same scene. I'm going to pick the first one I saw on the rushes. And it, um, it's, it's where Tahib walks Julia home. And uh, because that's the scene that convinced me we had, we, the, the, we had the two central young people spot on, you know, because I just watched it with a huge smile on my face. You know, the kiss is just brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, Julia, then. <laughs> If it was um, if it was a scene that I was in, um, it was probably the wedding because it shows what happens when, like Anthony loves someone regardless of the color of their skin, and it's just so wholesome and beautiful, and all his family are there to see that, and that really hit me because for that to be taken away from him is really really sad. Um, but in terms of like moment. My favourite moment of the whole shoot was uh, after we wrapped and we were at the wrap party and we had G Walker on stage and I was spinning her around and she was um, <laughs> looking at all the boys doing crazy dancing, you know, like, what's going on? And it just was so beautiful for us all be, uh, to be there together celebrating um, what we had just created. And yeah, I remember that fondly. Reiki. Oh, the wedding. Um, we did candy together. <laughs> <laughs> Which is just really joy. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, and there are loads of others, but yeah, I loved that. I loved all of us and, and the whole crew wondering how we all knew the steps. I loved it. <laughs> <laughs> I needed some lessons. I wasn't so good at it. Oh, wow. yeah, it's a secret mystery that, yeah. <laughs> 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 um, and to him, please. 
I'm not going to lie to you. I think any bit that Reiki's in is just like, I, Reiki, I, I've said this to you so many times, but I honestly think you are sensational. Yeah. Just incredible. Can I can they say that right back to the two of you? I mean, my goodness. Uh, you know, I hope when the two of you are up there that you remember that you worked with me once, okay? Because you're going to be my claim to fame for... <laughs> <laughs> As it. No. As it. Um, yeah, honestly, I think, yeah. A lot of us did incredible jobs. I think Reiki, especially, you had a tough job to do and you nailed it. Um, but I think I'd pick all of those moments, like the rap party, you know, that moment where, where you know, G refuses to dance at the rap party. She's like, oh, no, you, <laughs> don't, you don't have your fun. And then, and then I go, come on, come on, like, dance. And she goes, okay, if you put on some martial I'll dance. Like, that moment, like, that's, <laughs> that's the end. So, you know, I think, yeah, there's such a, you know, important and heavy piece but like there were little moments of joy like the like the rest the wedding reception like the rap party um you know like the first kiss like the first time me and julia met each other in the in the in the wardrobe yeah. there were lots of lovely <laughs> lovely lovely joyous moments thank you so much and you know thank you everybody for your time um it's been wonderful to talk to you i it's a powerful show and i hope people take away its bigger meaning and i um, really appreciate everyone's contribution to this and so my name is Akria Jamfi. Thank you, everybody. Just to remind everyone that Anthony will be available on BBC iPlayer. Please check the link in the description below to get um, access to that. And also, if you enjoyed this event, please consider donating to the BFI. They are a charity and their venues are closed during this lockdown. So your support helps keep them going during this period of closure. Thank you for watching and good night. <laughs>